Welcome to a journal club session where we break two sacred rules. Always serve food and discuss the evidence with other members of the group. I'm Lynn Stevenson, the Library Coordinator for Research Support based in Utah. I encourage you to grab a snack before you begin watching and we'll cover the discussion in the follow-up. Evidence-based practice is the integration of individual clinical expertise, the best available clinical evidence from systematic research and patients' values and expectations to provide effective and efficient patient care. It is a fundamental skill to be able to identify and appraise the best available external evidence. In this video, we'll discuss a robust and simple process for assessing the credibility of articles and their value to your clinical practice. Journal clubs, for the purpose of discussing the most current medical literature, have been in existence for generations. The first references date back to mid-19th century London, when there were fewer than 50 medical journals in the United States and Britain combined. Because these journals were hugely expensive, it became increasingly common for medical professionals to share journals and meet to discuss the evidence. As the number of journals increased exponentially throughout the 20th century, the focus of journal clubs became less about the cost and more about exposure to as much quality literature as possible. However, with online publishing came an explosion of medical journals to the over 30,000 now in existence worldwide. With that amount of research published each year, one must be able to critically assess its reliability, value, and relevance. Many of you may assume that Journal Club is primarily a student or resident activity. However, many physicians continue to participate throughout the course of their careers. One of the key objectives of Journal Club is to appraise current literature for clinical purposes. Critical appraisal begins with checking the following main sections, the article title and the year of publication. Regarding the title, does it state the trial's key objectives? The publication date, is the article current? Or if it's an older article, is it still relevant? Are the authors credible? How to evaluate an author's credibility is discussed in another video, Establishing the Authority of Authors. We also have to consider the quality of the journal. Is the journal peer-reviewed? And what is the peer review process? The presence of a true peer review adds robustness to the assessment criteria for research papers and indicates a reduced likelihood of the publication of poor quality research. But not all peer review is created equal. Check the journal's website for a description of its peer review process. What are the journal's metrics? This information can generally be found on the journal's website, in Scopus Metrics, or in Scamago, SJR Indicator. Pay attention to any declared funding or origin of research grants in order to check for any conflict of interest the authors may have. As you know, a randomized control trial consists of an introduction, reports the methods and results, a discussion of how the results relate to treatment, and conclusions of the investigators. An excellent introduction will thoroughly discuss earlier work related to the topic and the importance and limitations of what is previously acknowledged. It should address the necessity and purpose of the study, what has already been achieved and how this study's results might vary, the advantages along with possible drawbacks associated with the intervention or observations. Assessing the research methods used in the study is a prime step in its critical appraisal. This is done using checklists, which are specific to the study design. 
The methods section reports the details of how the study was conducted, including precise information regarding the study design, population, sample size, and interventions. The results section should clearly reveal what actually happened to the subjects. The results might contain raw data and explain the statistical analysis. These can be shown in related tables, diagrams, and graphs. The discussion section should include an absolute comparison of what is already known and the clinical relevance of what has been newly established. It summarizes the main findings of the study and relates them to any deficiencies in the study design or problems in the conduct of the study. This is called intention to treat analysis, a method for analyzing the results in a randomized study where all participants who were randomized were included in the statistical analysis regardless of which treatment, if any, they received. So let's look at the construction of a study. So what is the research question? For a study to gain value, it should address a significant problem within healthcare and provide new or meaningful results. What is the study type or design? The study design of the research is fundamental to the utility of the study. In a clinical paper, the methodology employed to generate the results is fully explained. In general, all questions about the related clinical query, the study design, the subjects, and the correlated measures to reduce bias and confounding should be adequately and thoroughly explained and answered. A confounder makes it appear as if there is a direct relationship between the exposure and the outcome, or might even mask an association that would otherwise have been present. What important potential confounders are considered? Are potential confounders examined and controlled for? Is confounding an important source of a bias? Knowing the baseline characteristics of the sample population is important because this allows researchers to see how closely the subjects match their patients. Normally, a trial should be large enough to have a high chance of detecting a worthwhile effect if it exists. I say normally because there's evidence to suggest that for some phase one and phase two trials, a smaller sample size is sufficient particularly when studying rare conditions, diseases, and populations. So what does the population represent? Does the study mention the eligibility criteria with the reasons for that criteria? Does it mention where and how the participants were recruited, selected, and assessed? Is the sample size justified and correctly calculated? Is it adequate to detect significant statistical and clinical results? Does it mention the type of randomization? Does it mention the presence of a control group or explain the lack thereof? Does it mention who was blinded? Does it tell us how the data was analyzed? And does the text match the tables? In other words, is the written description consistent with those tables. The Jadad scale, sometimes known as Jadad scoring or the Oxford Quality Scoring System, is a procedure to independently assess the methodological quality of a clinical trial. It is the most widely used such assessment in the world. However, it's not without its controversy as to how effectively it actually performs the function. This validated score ranges from zero to five. Studies are scored according to the presence of three key methodological features of randomization, blinding, and the complete accounting of all patients, including withdrawals. The Jadad score is assigned based on the answer to the five following questions. The maximum score can be six, with each question receiving zero for a negative response or one for a positive response. Was the study described as randomized? 
Was the randomization scheme described and appropriate? Was the study described as double blind? Was the method of double blinding appropriate? Were both the patient and assessor appropriately blinded? This question can receive two points if the blinding is described in detail. Was there a description of dropouts and withdrawals? Researchers use measuring techniques and instruments that have been shown to be valid and reliable. Validity refers to the extent to which a test measures what it is intended to measure. And how accurately does it actually measure? Are the statistical methods described appropriate to compare participants for primary and secondary outcomes? Are the statistical methods specified in sufficient detail that if I had access to the raw data, could I reproduce the analysis? Were the tests appropriate for the data? Are confidence intervals and p-values provided? Are results presented as absolute risk reduction as well as relative risk reduction? When we speak of reliability, we are referring to repeatability or consistency. In other words, how consistent a test is on repeated measurements. This is particularly important over the long term when assessments are made on different occasions and or by different examiners. Studies should state the method for assessing the reliability of any measurements taken, as well as the intra-examiner reliability. In research, bias occurs when systematic error is introduced into testing by selecting or encouraging one outcome over others. Bias can occur at any phase of research, including study design or data collection, as well as in the process of data analysis and publication. To minimize any bias within a study, the sample population should be representative of the general population. It is also imperative to consider the sample size in the study and identify whether the study is adequately powered to produce statistically significant results. Bias can be assessed with a variety of tools, CAS, JBI, and Cochrane, to name a few. Statistical significance, as shown by p-value, is not the same as clinical significance. Statistical significance judges whether treatment effects are explicable as chance finding, whereas clinical significance assesses whether treatment effects are worthwhile in real life. Small improvements that are statistically significant may not result in any meaningful clinical improvement. Other factors to consider when critically appraising articles are did the literature search include published and unpublished materials, as well as non-English language studies? How was the quality control of the studies maintained? Was a scoring system used to rate the studies? And was the analysis performed by at least two experts? The homogeneity of the studies. The clear and precise presentation of results and applicability to the local population. We can also check the Retraction Watch database to make sure there are no retractions associated with the article. A retraction may be of the article itself or any of its references. Critical appraisal is a fundamental skill for assessing the value of clinical research that integrated with clinical experience and patient concerns facilitates the practice of evidence-based healthcare. By following a systematic approach, research evidence can be confidently applied to clinical practice.